And Gais, it was so great to have you here and also the other Afghani women in the audience as well. Um, I wanted to start with a couple of quotes. Salam. Oh, I love that. Well, what's your greeting? I said hi, okay. Persian. No, I like it. Just always <laughs> trying to learn, you know, new language. I, I read a description of Afghanistan recently. Uh, it's, all, it's all quite bleak and depressing, right? But we might come to some hopeful point at the end because <laughs> we were talking earlier, there is some hope, but it is quite bleak and depressing. Um, someone called it Afghanistan a slow moving train wreck with no apparent long-term solutions in sight. And Gaysu, you've written very eloquently as well. And you've said that Afghanistan has become a black hole that swallows women. And many of us, as Katrina said, have been watching with horror what's gone on in your country. So I thought it might be useful for us all. And uh, if you don't mind, for you to maybe set the scene at, at the moment, what's going on. We're two years after um, the US leaving and the Taliban taking over. So what's life like? Because you're not on the ground, but you're obviously very, very much in touch with people there still. Thank you. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. And hello to everybody. I'm, I'm glad I'm here and I'm seeing everybody uh, bear with me if I get emotional. I get upset, I get angry, I hope it's a really nice space to share. And, and I'm coming with, with an open heart to just share as much as possible. If things don't make sense to you, if you cannot connect dots, I'll be happy to respond with any questions. Um, and we will have a Q&A at the end as of well. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so how is it yeah. um, in Afghanistan? Well, it turned out to be a black hole, right? When you have a black hole, what do you expect? Um, women in the country, unfortunately, I, th I think you probably see in the news every day that we have different decrees coming from the Taliban and they're using that as a cart, um, I believe, uh, for their political gain and political legitimacy in the international world. And they're using women, as I think so many other authoritarian government have done around the world, right? And women become, I think, that place where you can pressure right, and make your policy around it. Um, women are not allowed to go to schools um, and secondary education system. Um, if you don't have women in the school, it means teachers are not working either, right? And we don't have um, women going to parks. You cannot go to parks or use civic spaces without men. That men should have some close relationship with you, either it's your brother, your father, or your husband. If you don't have a husband, but for you, if you are a widow, right? If you don't have any men around you, then you shouldn't use a civic space. Uh, women don't have the right to play any kind of sports, unfortunately. I just name it. There is, you know, series of decrees just indicating that women cannot do this and cannot do that. Uh, the recent one just came out was that women are not allowed to, ha to work in the beauty salons, and women don't have the right to use beauty salons. Uh, to us, focusing in Afghanistan, I think for, for people who are not working, for housewives, for instance, women who are in the houses, beauty salon was a space where they could go and you know, socialize with other women. If it would take you one hour to stay in the beauty salon, they probably would tell their families that, oh, it, it was really busy, it took me, you know? Um, two hours or three hours. The reason they wanted to have that extra time was because they wanted to socialize with other women. So that space doesn't exist anymore. Because that was one of the only few spaces, wasn't it? Yes. That women could actually come together. Exactly. And I think that is the, the recent one, which is really heartbreaking. And also looking at it from a uh, woman economic empowerment uh, perspective, right? And what we have actually um, achieved for 20 years. Um, that is also taken away from them. I don't know if you saw the news that a lot of women uh, who were working in the salons uh, came on the streets and protested. Um, they were um, you know, shut down, they were arrested. And a lot of activists and protesters, unfortunately, are uh, experiencing detentions. And um, I was in contact with a lot of them when they were evacuated to Pakistan. Uh, unfortunately, they are going through traumas. And I think it's, it's harsh and it's extremely difficult to cope with the situation. Mm. And then the speed, right, that that is happening in the country. Uh, it is a black hole, I think. It, it is it's a black hole where we don't know how to, how to approach. Yeah, and there's also a humanitarian crisis at the same time, such poverty and deprivation at all at, at, at once with all of this going on with the Taliban as well. Exactly. I think one of the questions you might ask is that why 
Afghan people are not coming together to revolt, right? And that's really easy to say from outside. Afghanistan is a country that suffered um, war for years. Uh, people, generations are mentally ill. And on top of that, if your economy is not good, right, if you don't have food on your table, um, I don't think you will have the energy to go out and revolt. And we see that in Afghanistan. Sometimes women are the only group that resist it, and you don't see a lot of men coming. The question, if we are doing some sort of comparison between Iran and Afghanistan right now with the revolution, um, listen, I mean, Iran is a very educated society to us in Afghanistan, and um, they probably are not struggling as much as Afghan men struggle in Afghanistan, unfortunately. I think if we don't have food in your plate, it will be extremely difficult to, to revolt, right, to resist. Um, if you resist, you will be in detention. Uh, you will be, I just saw, it was really unfortunate, um, a teacher, after they closed universities, uh, some of you follow Ustad Mashal, right? And uh, Ustad Mashal was um, in prison for, for, for a very long time. Got out of prison, went to the hospital. Uh, now he's disabled. He cannot um, function anymore properly, unfortunately, because he was advocating for girls' education. And he was the first professor who resigned from university to resist mm. the Taliban's yeah. you know, decision on, on girls' education in universities. Um, um, closer for women. Mm -hmm. um, so now he doesn't function. If other men like him will see examples like that, I don't think not having food, right, uh, uh, struggling with life, and seeing that example would be yeah. would be hard. And I don't think it will give you that that energy to resist. I mean, I it was my f second time. Uh, I was I left Afghanistan um, and I was forced to leave. If I don't have the energy, yeah. right, to get up again and tell you a story of Afghan woman, I don't know if I can expect something from someone who is <laughs> struggling to live and survive in yeah. Afghanistan. And it's pretty challenging. So Gaisu has escaped from your country twice uh, in your lifetime. She's only 35, and I feel talking to you that you've lived 10 lifetimes when I, when I hear of all the things that have happened to you. And we're going to go back to your childhood and talk about sort of what shaped you as an activist uh, um, in, a, in a moment. But I wanted you to tell everyone about um, the 15th of August 2021, because that's two, nearly two years ago now, your second escape from Afghanistan. And the preceding time that you had a good job in the civil service, you were really empowering lots of women to get into jobs and... You know, things weren't perfect. It's not like it was a paradise in Afghanistan, but things were certainly, as Katrina alluded to there, a lot better. Tell us about um, that escape and those chaotic scenes that we would have all, I mean, we all saw Kabul airport and you were there trying, you know, to, for your life, to save your life, to get out of that place that you love so much. Um, I mean, collapse was, it was both a personal collapse, an emotional collapse and also a country collapse. All of them came together. Um, collapse to me was that you wouldn't be able, you, if you feel that, if, if you have that experience, I don't know if you can get up again. When I'm saying that, I really felt it. The first time leaving Afghanistan was um, a personal experience. But this one, I remember, I think I told you earlier that um, you have the civil service, right? And your job in the civil service is that you try to make sure to have enough women in the civil service. And you have different policies. You push the government to open spaces for women to work, especially in the leadership positions. And you have this machine, right? And out of nowhere, the machine stops. And when it stops, now I talk about it and I get goosebumps because I don't know how I was thinking that time, right? I don't know how my brain was functioning. The only thing I remember was that um, the day before the collapse, I know things were going very bad. And my sister, who is living in France, just got a ticket for me to leave Afghanistan as soon as possible. Um, and I said, I can't. I, I, I don't want to leave. Let's see what happens if the Taliban comes in. If they don't, let's see if I can resist and continue my, my advocacy in the country and my job, right? Um, well, I was supposed to leave on August 23rd. Um, that was 
when she got me a ticket, but the collapse happened on August 15th. Um, when I left uh, my office on August 14th, the only thing I could do was uh, to get my laptop. As I was getting out of my office, I, had, I was the head of the uh, complaints board in the uh, civil service. So the procedure was that any time you would apply for a position, if, they had, if there was some sort of discrimination against anyone through this process, they would come to my board and complain. Mm. And I would take you know, that procedure and I would look at the civil service law and then I would just make decisions. So we were three commissioners and I was leading about 35 people working in that board. And the woman just turned around and said, where are you going, right? <laughs> it was about one o'clock in the afternoon. I said, I'm going home, um, but I will see you all tomorrow. So I went to go to the bank to get some money. Um, it was, lines were really long, things looked really chaotic. I went to my apartment and Abdullah, my partner actually told me that I shouldn't return home and I shouldn't bring my government car because the whole neighborhood know that I'm working with the government and the car is also, the government's car, don't bring it. Take a taxi or wait, I'm gonna come and pick you up. It doesn't look okay. I went home, I, my mom asked me to leave the apartment. I left the apartment that night. Um, the next morning, I was about to get ready to go to the office um, and I, was, I heard that the, um, you know, the president left. All women, my colleagues, the civil service, were just calling me to asking me if they could go to work and I said, don't. I said, wait one or two days. Um, I will, let's stay in touch because we had a group, group chat. Uh, I said, wait, um, let's stay in touch. Let's see how things are gonna go. Uh, they said, well, the Taliban entered. And I said, yes, they entered, then don't go. They, what, what happens, we have our things left in the office. And I said, give up on that right now because it's, we don't know how things are gonna yeah. you know, turn out. For three days, um, as you know, it was extremely challenging to be evacuated to the United States. And I, I also had a US passport. Um, I didn't approach the US. The reason I didn't want to approach the US was the process was really long and it was dramatically hard to get to the airport. Um, I have a couple of really good friends in Poland um, and they put me and Abdullah in their first list. Okay. And I was contacted from the Polish embassy. They told me if I'm ready to be evacuated. And I couldn't because I said, I, I can't. Like, they said, the only thing you need to bring is your backpack and nothing else. And I said, I can't. I have the whole apartment. I cannot live like this. And I think my mom cried. And Abdullah just told me that this is the only chance you need to leave. We left. Um, we went to the airport and I think I'm sharing this experience and a lot of you exper experienced um, the gate, the Abbey Gate is probably the most well-known gate that the explosion happened later um, in August. I left the night before the explosion happened. So leaving, I was outside the gate for about um, 24 hours mm -hmm. and I was, because the Taliban were just beating everybody outside the gate and I just didn't want to be beaten up because that, I didn't want to experience that in my life that I was beaten up by the Taliban, right? And I just didn't want to ignore that. I asked Abdullah to return home and I called my mom and I said, I don't want to leave. And my mom said, don't come home. I cannot have you because we were already hidden for three days in my aunt's house. And I was, not, I was asked to not go to my apartment because uh, it was recognized and there, there was a home search started right away. The Taliban started doing a home search on the government employees. In the airport, we didn't drink or eat for 48 hours. Um, then we were evacuated to Poland's refugee camp. Um, I think that is an experience that I have never, I don't know how to make my, you know, my brain around it. When I was doing my master's in human rights in um, Columbia University back in 2018, uh, when some, students were doing research on refugees and refugees in the camp. I was just looking around and I was asking them why they are doing it. Because maybe I was really naive, I was really young, I didn't have this experience. As soon as, you know, I became a refugee and I became in that camp, I said, oh, <laughs> this is what it is, right? This is what uh, uh, people are talking about. And um, experiencing that the second time and having that um, 
I don't know how mm -hmm. that, that hopeless moment in the refugee camp was yeah. pretty dramatic. And, and Geza did something amazing when she went to the camp. She started talking to people and gathering stories. And we'll talk about that a bit later because that's a massive part of your work, making sure that all those memories and all those stories don't get lost in time and that they're there as a record. But would you maybe take us back to your childhood as well? Because that was the second time you escaped. Um, the first time you described it as more personal. Uh, and maybe I'll just tell everyone that actually you were, um, that you had an arranged marriage from when you were six years old. Uh, and which sounds so bizarre for us here, but something that happens in your country. Will you tell us how that happened and how it led to you escaping the first time? Mm -hmm. um, I think forced marriage became, I, th I think I didn't understand it from the beginning until I started studying gender studies in the University of Virginia and I didn't know why forced marriage or child marriage was happening. Um, I'm. I grew up in a very uh, rural, perhaps, area of Afghanistan, a district that's called Jaghari in its, in its Ghazni province. Um, it's about eight, eight or nine hours uh, from Kabul. Um, and also my grandfather had um, a huge farm and perhaps was part of a, a feudalist system back in the 60s and the 50s um, of Afghanistan. Um, I, I was... I was forced to get engaged to a warlord's son. The warlord, the warlord was actually controlling the community, right? The district, because that was the, the only way they could survive. And it was, that was a product of the Civil War. And I, I was born during the Civil War. Um, so he pushed uh, my father and my grandfather to give him the land. And they didn't have any resources to, um, to maintain you know, their fight and living in the mountains during the nights. Um, my dad resisted and my father resisted that they couldn't give the land and they wanted, and this guy wanted to marry uh, my older sister. Um, my older sister, which I think is interesting, my, my older sister for uh, seven months before she escaped uh, had to wear um, men clothes and had to learn how to fire Kalashnikovs. And I learned that too as a child because we needed to protect ourselves and there was nothing that, that could help us. And every night for seven months, she was sitting on top of the roof of our house so that we wouldn't have any malicious to enter our house, kidnap me, my mom, or her. So she wanted to protect herself. So finally, after seven months, she escaped, uh, went and joined my uncle in another district. Um, and then the warlord just noticed that she's She's probably engaged, right? That's what my father told him uh, to somebody else. Now, my, um, it's my turn, right? I needed to be given to, to the warlord's son. That's when I was engaged, um, yeah. when I was six years old. Coming forward um, five or six years later when I turned 11 years old, um, my older sister returned. It was back in 2000, a year before the collapse of the Taliban in the first period. Um, my older sister returned and she actually, it was her engagement you know, ceremony in town. Uh, the warlord found out that my father lied to him um, six years ago. And a week before my older sister engagement, um, my uh, father got kidnapped and this warlord kidnapped my father. And I, perhaps now when I'm thinking about it, maybe the intention was that the, he would pressure my dad to not let my older sister to marry the guy that she wanted, right? So that he would have the opportunity to marry my older sister. My older sister, the engagement never happened. Um, my dad kidnapped in 2000. It has been 23 years now. We don't know what happened to him. We don't know. I think what, what we heard, it was an oral kind of story coming back to us later in, um, in 2015. I heard when I returned to Afghanistan, I heard that, that he was given to, he was moved from our district, sent to Kandahar, and then was given to somebody and he was taken to, um, to Chaman. Chaman is a place in Pakistan. And gave it to a Pakistani family to keep him for a little bit. So my dad had seizure problem and was getting medication. Uh, he 
when he was kidnapped, he didn't have his seizure medication to put him in sleep at night, um, and he couldn't survive after a week. So for the warlord, it was extremely hard to, he couldn't bring him back, right? And my, dad, my mom was uh, pregnant three months. We have the twins uh, in Poland. Um, Your mother had a lot of pregnancies. Um, I'm one of the 10th, uh, five brothers, five sisters. My mom, was get, my mom got pregnant 18 times, eight of them died, three times twins. Sorry if that is a very <laughs> long, but yes. Um, the, the reason a lot of them died was because it was premature. And the, the last twins were the only one who were born in the hospital. Mm. Everybody one uh, were born in the house. This boy that you were uh, engaged to, which is at six years of age, um, eventually the father wants um, him to sleep with you and you're in your teens at this point. I was, I think, uh, when my dad... 15 or something? Right. When, when my dad got kidnapped, the warlord never came to us um, and for three years. That is when I was actually, you know, going to high school, doing a lot of community works. Um, and also, the regime changed. We couldn't ask anybody what happened to my dad. We couldn't ask him. Um, back in 2004, I started... Um, a local radio came to my community, um, Internews, if you know, uh, gave 114 inter, um, radio stations across the country, um, and it was an FM radio station. One of them came to my town. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember I was listening to this radio. The only thing in my childhood I would listen to was radio, BBC radio, and I would listen to woman voice coming from the radio, and I thought that is an ideal, right, to to go work as a journalist. I didn't know it's called journalist. I was really young by that time. I wrote a letter <laughs> to the radio. I, I said, it. I said, listen, um, I really enjoy your radio show and it's unfortunate that you don't have any woman voice coming and I don't hear any woman voice. They read my letter in the radio and they asked me to join them and um, just work there. I mean, I didn't talk to my mom or anybody the next day I went to the radio. They sent me to Kabul and I was trained. And this is your first time in Kabul, it's right? It's my first time, a village girl getting up and going to Kabul to be trained on uh, journalism skills, right? How to read a report, how to, you know, there was a lot of logistics I needed to learn. Uh, it's the same time that I was pushed to sleep with this um, warlord son who was my fiance and I believe that, well, I guess I am, I am his, his wife, and I really need to agree to that, and um, they did the agreement, they did, it's called nikah. Uh, nikah is when a mullah comes and do the ceremony, and then I wasn't present there. Uh, a woman should be present when they do nikah. Um, I wasn't part of the ceremony at all. And when you say you're imprisoned in, in, in the house, like? No, in the actual ceremony. It's happening in a, in a specific location. It's not, it's not happening in the house. It has to be there in a mosque, in a guest room, somewhere. So it's all men sit together. And then I should have a representation. It could be my father or my brother. Uh, I didn't have my father. I don't know who represented me. I don't remember as much. Um, but I was pushed to sleep with him. Um, so maybe I usually don't talk about that experience as much publicly. One day I hope I will have the energy to do. Um, but that, tra traumatic experience, but at the same time, also this radio thing was happening at the same time. And you really stood your ground as well. I think it did. That's when my activism started. Mm. As soon as I noticed that a lot of young girls were listening to my programs and they were giving me calls all the time and, and trying to, to engage with me, I think was the moment I feel like anything I do in the community matters. And there is at least a group who likes me. If religious leaders or community leaders don't like me because I challenge them, right? Maybe I, I do something for a group of people who would like to hear my voice. Mm. Um, and I worked there for three years um, until 2007. I ended up knowing, uh, fortunately, um, two American women soldiers in my town because I was part of, I had to manage uh, to welcome the new governor in town and I had to manage the event. Now I'm thinking about it. The reason they chose me, because everybody was against me, especially men, the reason they chose me to manage that program was because a lot of foreigners were coming in our town. They had to show a different face of, mm. of the district. And they had, I had to be there, right, to manage. And I had these skills. And I knew how to publicly speak. Um, that's when I learned to American women 
who were in that event, and they asked about me and my work. My English was not as good. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I barely could communicate. Uh, they, the next day, the translator contacted me and told me that I was chosen to go to the United States for 20 days for a conference. So this is in 2007 at the beginning when I am in my um, midterm exam of high school, two months before my marriage ceremony because it was going to happen and I was not allowed to study um, uh, university and I was not allowed to take any, uh, you know, um, entrance exam mm. in Kabul. So I didn't tell anybody. Um, everything happened. I went to Kabul. I got my passport. <laughs> you were planning this wedding. Every, I think everybody was planning that wedding. <laughs> my mom was planning the wedding. I was, I was not part of it, and I didn't know. I was just focused on my work and also doing a lot of other community works, teaching women literacy classes, doing interesting stuff, um, although I was, I guess, I was very young at that time. So on July 10th, 2007, I said goodbye to my mom and I cried and I said, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if I'm going to return, but I'm going to leave. Yeah. That was my departure uh, the first time, which was for good and for bad. I think for good because it gave me the opportunity to learn and be skilled and go back and help other women. And I would yeah. like to give one more anecdote. What pu uh, pushed me to become an advocate? There are two things. One. Um, in one point, I think in 2005 or six, I told my mom that it's too much walking. I'm walking two hours every day to get to the radio and I'm exhausting and I have too many classes and it's hard. She turned around and she said, I'm washing five pairs of clothes every week so that you have enough clothes to go to work and to go to school. I'm cooking for you and I'm not allowing any family man to say anything about you and you do whatever you want to do. You know why I do all of this? Because I want to hear your voice when I cook in the kitchen, <laughs> right? And can you please not leave the radio? Can you please stay as long as you can? And the second one, when I was in the United States, um, I was crying and I was upset and I missed my radio show so much. Um, she told me, she said, listen, girls in Afghanistan um, don't have the opportunity that you do. Use that opportunity, learn the language, get your university degree because you couldn't do that in Afghanistan. You need to return because there are so many young girls who probably were forced to marriage too. You need to return and help them. That was massive for you, wasn't it? That was. And I think that was, every time she was telling me that, I would just get up again and get energetic and continue like, doing hearts in my classes and you know, learn more and make sure that I, I get everything that's necessary to return. And in 2015, you did go back. And you had that in your heart, that motivation. You wanted to go back to the country that you love and help other young girls and women. And for a while, you were able to do that. I did. I mean, when I was in the US, I did a lot of activism around um, women's rights. I was doing a lot of, you know, writing a lot of articles, trying to make sure that I was engaged with Afghanistan. Um, I returned, um, I was hidden for six months because this warlord and also the ex-fiance got married. How it was, it <laughs> got married and um, I, was, I was hidden for six months. I wouldn't go to the public radio or I wouldn't go to you know, TVs. I wouldn't do like vocal activism as much. Um, in 2013, before I go to Afghanistan, the head of the Human Rights Commission, Dr. Simo Samar, as you all know, uh, is from my district, returned and talked to the religious leaders and the community leaders to, to force this guy, the warlord, to sign a contract. Basically, what was stated in that contract was that I am not belong to his son. In another part of the story, is sorry because it's too complicated. <laughs> his daughter was also engaged to my brother. It was an exchange deal. So I was... In the contract, it was saying that I am not belong to his son and his daughter is not belong to my... So the deal was... The deal was going to be cancelled. Dissolved, yeah. Only if we agree to not ask him about our father. Right. And then we had to make that decision. I, we knew that there, it was 15 years and we thought that maybe he was not alive. And my mom said that, I think for, for your future and for your brother's future, let's make the deal. 
and I wasn't there. They signed the contract, so I didn't belong to him anymore. When I returned in 2015, I was still hidden because I thought that the fiancé was really angry. He would do something to me, although he was married. Um, but in 2018, the Taliban attacked his house, killed him, three sons, two wives. So by this time, this guy had about five wives, about 40-something children um, living in the same house. So the Taliban attacked and all of them got killed. Some wives and some children survived. Uh, later on, I heard that they were moved to, um, to Kabul and some of them went to other, other countries. I think UNHCR processed some of their cases, but I never engaged with them. Um, I don't know. After, I think after 2018, what happened to them, I became more um, vocal and I could, you know, give interviews, I could do jobs, I could stay more flexible. And, and Keza, when you think about that, what, those children and those wives and all the, the, those forced marriages and the fact that you managed somehow to escape that fate, I mean, do you ever reflect on that now? And, and the trauma, I imagine, is still very much there of all that you had to go through as a young woman, you know, just developing and growing up. I Sometimes I, I think I want to talk to the wives, the one who survived. Um, I, in one point, um, I just wanted to go and see them back, I think, in 2019. And my mom didn't let me do that because um, she thought it's not appropriate. Um, and I really want, I wanted to see how the wives were doing. And I think every single wife that he had, the, the brothers of this wife were his bodyguard. If you had a bodyguard, right, if the bodyguard had a sister, he would go and marry pressuring the bodyguard. So two of them happened like that. And um, unfortunately, the bodyguards got killed, right? Two of the wives got killed. And everybody, I think I sometimes do reflections. I think I grew up so much. <laughs> um, things that I have learned by now when I look back at it, um, my family, we have, including my father, we have four men got kidnapped um, by the Soviet and also by the Taliban or by him. And from my mom's side, we have seven people got killed um, in war uh, by the Taliban. So we have, we are a family of menless. We have a lot of widows. We have a lot of children who never experienced living with their fathers. Um, and I think that circumstance actually pushed our women of the family to stand up, to just resist and continue uh, living. Mm -hmm. um, I think when I do that reflection, I think the reason the way I talk right now is maybe sometimes people laugh at me when I say this, is that maybe if we had my grandfathers, we had all masculine men, perhaps, right, um, and directing our lives in Afghanistan, I wouldn't be the way I am right now. I am not happy that I don't have my father. I'm not happy that my mother lost so many brothers and, and my grandpa. I'm not happy that we have so many widows around the world now. But I think the circumstances allowed us to, to put ourselves together and continue fighting for ourselves and also mm. for other women, perhaps, in the country. Mm. You've described um, escaping the second time, ending up in a refugee camp in Poland. And this is where your work, which has taken you all around the world, <laughs> talking to exiles, um, your, your countrymen and women, you started to talk to people in the camp and just you, you got so much from it yourself, but you also realized how important it was that these stories get recorded. Tell us about those first conversations when you, and how you started it as a project. Back in 2019, when the uh, peace deal, the peace conversation, peace talk perhaps started uh, between the US and the Taliban and also later on, you know, the Afghan government officials, uh, we started a campaign called uh, a Feminine Perspective Campaign. Uh, we were going back to women who went to school during the Taliban time between 1996 to 2001. I wanted to collect stories, to collect these testimonies, and give it to the, to the delegation, especially women who were part of, you know, delegation representing Afghanistan. Give it to them, so just in case if the Taliban would challenge them, they would have these testimonies right around the country that would demonstrate their rules and the the um, how oppressive it was during yes, that time when the Taliban was exactly. There, yeah. uh, when I came to the camp, uh, I mean the first 
two days at least. Um, um, I apologize. I'm, I, I respect Afghan men so much. Um, all Afghan men wouldn't communicate with me. Um, they were. There were times I was really depressed. Me and Abdullah would get out of the room because our room didn't have. Um, we, we couldn't lock it, and then it had a hole. It was really um, not safe to mm -hmm. just in. I was really upset. We would go to the park, and then we would cry, and, and we'd sit together, and I would just ask Abdullah, can I have a cigarette? Can I just, can I just smoke with you because I cannot take this anymore? <laughs> the whole, because we had about 40-something people there, when they were looking at me as if I was, as if I committed a sin, right? Just... And also they blamed Abdullah for allowing him to let me smoke cigarettes. So you weren't the kind of woman that yes. they thought was and be also behaving I, the right way. Exactly. You so didn't have a scarf on your head. I huh? didn't. And I was also probably not representing the right Afghan woman, which I totally understand. And I totally, maybe I'm not. The way I'm totally, totally westernized, I'm not representing the Afghan woman that they know and they think is appropriate. I do have respect for them. And when you had your life in Kabul, you were, you know, you didn't always have to wear a scarf. And I you didn't. Did I live a sort of different kind of life than maybe people in the in the provinces and in the in the countryside. Yeah, I think one of the lessons, as you asked about, about it, I was one of the lessons I learned for my activism and women's rights, maybe that was not the right approach. Maybe having, I was, I guess using, you know, red lipsticks, not having my scarf, you know, having tight jeans and just demonstrating and telling people that, you know what, this is how I am, you need to accept. Living like a freedom. Having yes, your own. and maybe Afghanistan was not ready for that yet. Now I'm doing an internal reflection. Maybe I needed to, to wear my scarf. I needed to go to the communities. I needed to connect to people. I needed to connect to Afghan women so that we would have you know, a better relationship now, so that the women in the districts would believe in us, right? The movement that was created in the cities. Um, it's so interesting, because you're talking about maybe there was a divide there, that there was women who just didn't have the same motivations and goals as you did, and there was no communication between the two. I think maybe not divide in terms of what they enjoyed, going to work, going to school, oh, yeah, yeah. right? But maybe divide in terms of understanding as there wasn't a lot of engagement in a way that we are not doing this because we ask you to take off your scarf, yeah. right? And you don't have to wear red lipstick. Or yes, you can jeans. wear whatever you want to, but do you have the right to decide that, right? That was our point. Do you have the right as a woman to decide whether you wear this coat or not? If you can make that decision, then do whatever you want to do, right? And when I came to the camp, I had that experience. I, I thought about it, and I reflected. Maybe I was really upset by that time. I contacted my Louis Beckford, who is um, leading Memoria. Memoria is a platform where you collect human rights defenders are using that platform to collect their testimonies, personal narratives. I contacted and I said, people are not talking to me. I, it's, I'm feeling so alone, and it's extremely difficult. Um, and I said, I'm going to pilot. Um, at least about 10 stories um, to, to talk to at least women who are in these rooms. I want to knock their doors. I know they will not like me, but I would like to talk <laughs> to them. I know they need a space to cry. I need a space to cry. I just need to share. But I think what I found out in the camp was that if they were in Afghanistan, they wouldn't talk to me. Yeah. Now that we are sharing the same experience being a refugee, that similar experience probably was allowing us to sit and talk. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I started engaging with them. Later on, I was, those men became my friends. We were smoking together, which was fine. We, we, were, having, we were trying to change the atmosphere for better, and especially for kids. So as, re as refugees, you could see much more the commonality between yourselves. It was much more apparent exactly. than perhaps it had been. And we, I think what, what was really heavy for everybody in that camp was that you lost a country, um, nothing left. What, what else? Sh why should we keep ourselves so strict, right? Um, the country is gone. Um, everything is gone. We lost our lives. We cannot return. We are in exile. We cannot see our family members. We don't know what happened to our houses, to our you know, clothes. Our, one of the questions I asked them, or I, I asked all of them, I have 230 stories now, I asked them what was a single item they wanted to bring with them, but they couldn't. Um, I saw a woman in Florida, United States. 
she turned around and she said, listen, um, I didn't value materials. I have my education, I have my experience, and I have my degree. Does my degree matter here in the United States? It doesn't, right? It, it, it doesn't matter uh, to, to anybody. Uh, I'm a refugee and I'm a refugee and I have to start from zero. And, and you know, I backed up and I said, I mean, that is true. Uh, some people said, well, I wish, they wish they had you know, a flag from Afghanistan. Some talked about clothes. But I think that was the moment I said, listen, we, I think it's not about we lost the country. It's about what we gained for 20 years that are gone now. Now, when you look at the country, that women cannot go to schools. I mean, women can wear scarves, right? And it's OK, but they need to have the right to go to schools and get their education. I think two years are already late. Um, you look at the Taliban changing curriculums right now. You look at the curriculum they put together. Now, in a point when I do advocacy, I basically question that, question my advocacy, saying that, well, maybe I shouldn't advocate for, for Grocery schools to be open because when it's open, you're going to train more, you know, terrorists yeah. and give it to, to the world and give it to Afghanistan. That is not probably the right approach that mm. can help the country. I'm curious, and, and some of the women in the audience as well, who Katrina mentioned earlier, the, the sense of belonging. Because when you are exiled like that, and you have experiences where you've been in Poland, where you've been to America, you have family in France. Um, there's people here uh, make, trying to make their homes in Ireland, but it, it is exile. Tell me about belonging. How do you gain a sense of belonging in a place when you're far away from everything that you hold dear, but you have to find some sense of self and belonging in a new place? How have you found that? I don't think you can, I don't think you can find that. It's unfortunate. Um, when you're a refugee, you are a refugee, either by definition or by any structure you put in. Um, I, do, I mean, for me, I thought it was easier to live in the US after the evacuation, right? Because I lived in the US for eight and a half years. I thought it was not going to be difficult, but I think it was twice as difficult. That's interesting. Every time I was going to, I was coming to the US, I, wouldn't, I couldn't stay more than 10 days. I think there was something calling from Afghanistan and asking me to return. I think that, belong, that, that feeling of belonging was really strong in me. After the collapse happens, I feel like I, I have a hole in my heart um, that, I ca that I cannot feel, right? And it's, it's so empty that it doesn't matter what you do, nothing, nothing helps that. But I think that I went to France, I went to Canada, I got some stories from Pakistan, I went to Poland, I went to so many states in the United States. I couldn't see that happening. Mm -hmm. And I think that feeling of you're not, you're losing your identity, right? Your identity was shaped around your surroundings and your country. Um, I was giving a talk in Warsaw one time and I said, listen, you, you know, I love Warsaw and it's so beautiful. <laughs> Imagine someone will just come and just take that away from you and ask you to leave. What are you going to do? How mentally are you going to make sense of it? And I think um, for us, being in exile, um, it's going to take a long time um, to, to recover. Um, the reason I said Afghan Voices of Hope was because I was going around to look for hope. I really wanted. I just wanted to open a door and just get a smile. And I wanted, as I remember, I went to Kansas City. I saw an, a man, military man, who fought during the Soviet and also fought for a very long time, for 20 years in Afghanistan. I looked at him and I said, what do you miss the most? He just grabbed and he cried and he said, can you be my daughter because I left my daughter home? And I was, I mean, I was shocked and I, I expected that, right? And I'm full of stories, I'm full of narratives. And I think the reason I knocked so many doors was because I just wanted to share that I'm also suffering. Mm -hmm. It's not because I lived in the US for eight and a half years. It's not, I'm not different than you. I'm not, you know, yeah. our, your loss is my loss and we, we lost it together. But I think something I found 
I hope that it's a little bit hopeful, is that I met a lot of um, young girls who didn't live, who didn't um, born during the Civil War. So between that 2000 and 20, 2021, 2021, the only thing they understood was a modern Afghanistan, right? Going to school, going to you school. Know, the parent, the mother's working. You know, exactly. Yeah. And um, but now these women, I think, are giving me an energy. Every day I'm mentoring a lot of them, and I'm hoping that next year, in the next five years, I will track at least five of them, because whoever I talk to. Um, are willing to go back. Mm -hmm. I think we do have As you that, were, as you were. As I was, right? Yeah. I don't think anybody likes this luxury of living in Ireland or living in the United States or I, what they tell me, this young generation tell me that, listen, we are here, we don't want to cry, you know what we do? We want to go to universities, we want to learn the language, we want to get all these skills because that is important for the country. Mm. I think that's where I get my energy and my hope uh, to continue fighting and hoping that one day it will be a different circumstance mm -hmm. and we return home and, and share, I think, and tell the next generation in Afghanistan that why other countries developed. Yeah. I think we learned that by being in Galway, right? Being in Ireland or being in the United States, learning from others. and. I met a lot of great uh, friends around the world who understood me, who um, supported me, mm -hmm. and who showed me how to resist. And I think these skills are needed uh, to have. And yeah, you know, I'm gonna open it to questions in a minute, but I really I want to know how your mother is. How is my mother? <laughs> because I feel like she's been such a massive influence and she's been through so much and all that intergenerational trauma and all that loss that she experienced and yet she just wanted, as you said, to hear your voice in her kitchen on the radio. She wanted you to come back to help young girls. She sounds like an incredible person. Uh, so I would like to send, to share some anecdotes of what she tells me right now. I, I hope it will make sense. Uh, she was in France, she came to Poland and then I got a car, I drove all of them from Poland to France and then gave it to my sister. I said, can you please take care of this group? I have to go take care of others, right? <laughs> I've done it, I've done it. I've done it, so I think it's your time. Can you please help me out? Um, I think she is really flexible in readjusting herself. Um, sometimes people are talking about women's rights in Afghanistan is an export of the Western world. I mean, to me, it's not. My mother proved that it's not. Because my mother pushed me to go to university. My mother pushed me to, to return and work. Mm -hmm. um, she went to third grade. You know why she's pushing all the kids to go to schools? Even my brother's wives. Because she went to third grade and she was not allowed to study after that because the boys and girls schools in that time were together and mm -hmm. the father didn't allow that. And she has that internal. Mm -hmm. And that's no Western influence. That's, that's not. purely from her. Yes. And, her and she was never exposed to any TVs, mm -hmm. any, you know, any Western values per yeah. se. Now she is, she is struggling with diabetes. Um, she has some, some children in France because I'm one of the 10th. Some still left in, in India. I couldn't figure out how to help them to get out. I am in the United States. Um, I have two siblings in France. But what she tells everybody right now is that, listen, remember what Gesu did? Remember when I was telling you that Gesu was washing dishes in McDonald's to make some money so that she could go to school? She would give those examples. Remember how hard she worked, not because I'm pausing myself, <laughs> but uh, remember that that's what you need to do right now. Um, so she is going to French class. She is, she is 65 and she said, I don't want to depend on any of my children. I would like to learn how to you know, take a flight, how to take a train. <laughs> Uh, how to go from one country to another to see my, you know, sisters, to see my children. And that's why I want to learn the um, language. So two weeks ago, she had her asylum interview. Mm -hmm. And the asylum officer asked her, uh, who wrote your application, you know, to apply for asylum in France? She said, a French guy. The asylum officer asked, why a French guy? You don't have anybody else? She said, well, the French guy is living with my daughter. <laughs> and the officer said, wait, are they married? She said, no, they're girlfriend and boyfriend. It's OK, they just live there, and I don't want to interfere in their life. She has come a long way. Exactly. And I, 
I laughed and I said, wow, she's very flexible. And she's just like <laughs> twisting things and readjusting herself. I think that gives her a lot of space and yeah. gave us a lot of space to, um, to grow. And also she's pushing my, to my brother's um, wives. And she always tells them that, listen, women are not for the kitchen. Yeah. And I want you to go out, have your own car, have your back on, have your glasses on, go to work, come back. <laughs> if you have time to cook, you cook. If not, <laughs> it's not for you. So. And thank you so much for telling thank us all you. about her. I mean, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. she's great. What, what's her name, Gesu? What? What's her name? Jamila. Jamila. Does anybody have any questions for Gaysu? I'm sure you all do. As I said at the beginning, like I feel like you've lived 10 lifetimes and you're 35, you're well, an It was not really powerhouse. exhausting because when I start, it just <laughs> keeps going on and no, on and on. great, <laughs> we didn't want you to stop. There's a gentleman over there. Um, is, there is there a microphone coming around or will you? you? Yes, great, speak up too. Oh, we'll have the microphone down, okay. Hold your wish there for just a second. Um, Coming down. Okay, here we go, just to your right there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm a professor in this university. First of all, very welcome to our university and to our city. Um, I very much admire, uh, admire you as an Afghan woman as an advocate and for the courage you have shown to share your story. I came to Ireland about 38 years ago as a refugee myself, so I can feel your pain. And I work very closely with many Afghan friends uh, here in Galway, some of whom are here, and many young women amongst them. So the question I have is, what do you think we can do at grassroots levels in Afghanistan to bring about transformation of the society, to allow women to reach their full potential and play their rightful place in Afghan society. Thank you very much. Um, what can we do now? Um, I don't think we can do a lot, um, but I have been doing a lot of research to find entry points, right, to make recommendations that are more um, doable inside the country. I think there are certain things we can do. Um, one, in the international level, I think we shouldn't let the story die, particularly if the Taliban will be legitimized. Um, I think that's, the actual, that's when the actual um, struggle starts. Right now, we have enough attention on women in the country, and if all the countries are trying to pressure the Taliban because of women and using, you know, playing that card, um, I think we really need to continue the advocacy and talk to whoever in, in your government, because you're a taxpayer, you need to hold them accountable for the decisions they are making, especially you know, the foreign policy that will impact Afghanistan. That is one. And the grassroots, I think um, we, had, um, we had a lot of community organizations developed for 20 years um, in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, they are still active. We don't talk about it. Um, there are the districts that still have schools opened. There are hidden things, aren't there? There are hidden it's fascinating. things. fascinating. We don't talk about it. <laughs> and the Taliban, what they do is that they say, well, I can give you permission, but you shouldn't talk about it, right? <laughs> don't say it in Facebook, because Facebook became a tool. Um, I think they need to be used. I think the most important part, if you ask that from an advocate, I think I can only talk about that part. I'm not, you know, I'm not an engineer or a doctor or you know, a health um, expert, but I think we need to make sure that the civil society of Afghanistan to help any group accountable survive. We practiced and experienced civil society for 20 years um, in Afghanistan. We just learned how things are working and what could be the impact. We just learned after 20 years. It's a very you know, slow move and you just see the impact way later. Um, and I think the organizations shouldn't die, especially the women-led organizations. They exist, but unfortunately, they are changing from the development to the humanitarian um, uh, part and implementing service delivery. 
which is not helping the civil society. And I think there is still activists on the ground in, in a lot of provinces. And there is still a lot of community leaders who are on board, especially, I don't know if you know CDCs. CDCs are, I believe, community development councils. We have more than thousands of them um, around uh, the country. I think that would be an entry point to work with them. Because in these CDCs, they have religious leaders, they have community leaders, they have women leaders, uh, because it's sure us, right? And I think they become really important when it comes to bargaining, when it comes to you know, health facilities to be open, schools open. Those are the only entry points we have right now. I don't think we can do more, but in the long term, I'm hoping that we will maintain a very vibrant, uh, strong, uh, hopefully, um, civil advocates who would hold either the international world or any government and plus accountable for what the decisions they are making. Well, hopefully those bright young women coming back yeah. eventually um, will be very much part of that too. Thank you very much for your question. Does anyone else have a question before we wrap up? Anybody else? Is there someone? There have been. There, there's a young lady in the front here. Can we have the microphone down here? Oh, she asked. Oh, sorry. Who is it? Oh. Was there somebody here or not? I, did I miss? Miss on top, she is. Oh, OK. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, I'm curious about something. So like we often talk about Taliban rule in the country. And since the, the collapse, we've seen like horrific scenes of people falling down from the planes and everything. But I don't think the media is talking enough about the role of the United States and in this economic and political chaos, especially the late dialogue about the white savior and oh my God, without the United States, like see, that's the country it, it, as it is right now. So I'm really curious, what do you think of, the, of this? It's a great, great question. And I mean, essentially they walked away after spending 20 years, you know, caring and putting a lot of thing in and then suddenly gone. So it's a very good question, thank you. The United States intervention in Afghanistan was not to save women. That was not their initial agenda. That was not their initial strategy. I know it, and I studied it, and they used women as a card to get in. As the Taliban are using women again. I think we become this, I don't Let's know. Let's go what, football. Exactly. Yeah. We're just, everybody's playing, playing around us. And I don't think they used, you know, they were, Back, I was probably really young, I just read about it, that they were using, you know, oh, we need to save the women in Afghanistan, and especially, you know, using burqa as an example, we want to go and save them. And also later on, if you noticed it, after the shift, the intervention shift back in, uh, in 2014, that's when they decided to withdraw slowly, right? So they said they are not gonna have boots on the ground. Uh, they also started talking about um, about not building a government for the country. They were not there. Basically, they say, well, our, our mission was not to build a country and build a government so that the governance would be the best component of their work in the country. That was not, I think we Afghans were fool enough to, to not know that from the early on. I mean, I remember, you all remember when, uh, when the collapse happened, the reason I didn't leave was, in my head, I was saying that, you know what, the US is not gonna leave. The U.S. has a political intention in the country. It's not going to leave. The Taliban is not going to happen. So the reality was that we were fooled. We in Afghanistan didn't understand that they were playing with us. I think one of the lessons that we learn is that anything they said, we said yes, right? Because they were pouring money as the same thing they do, 40 billions every, every week right now. That goes to the Taliban. The same thing, right? That was not their intention. Um, and we thought that was their intention. We, we didn't understand you know, the, the details of what was happening under the ground. Um, so I don't think I expect anything. The difference mm -hmm. between the United States and the Taliban playing with women yeah. is on the same, you know. Okay. That answers your question. And um, thank you so much. You've been an absolutely brilliant audience. I, I, I've been so privileged to meet you, Gay Sue, and to listen to you. I know you're going to talk to some of the women as well um, now and give them some time and hopefully be able to connect with them in the future. But for now, thank you so much for being so, such a great audience. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Gay Sue.
I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.